Hello and welcome to the part two of uh, the webinar about anytime real-time learning in face-to-face -face and virtual classrooms. Uh, my name is Julie Coiro. I'm a professor at the School of Education at the University of Rhode Island in the United States. And again, for those of you who are just joining us, um, there is a URL that you can click on and access in order to follow along with the slides and have access to the slides after. And you can also um, put your uh, cell phone and use the QR code uh, and access the slides that way. So in this segment of the webinar, we're going to really talk a little bit more about particular digital tools and practices that have worked well for others and for me in our um, experiences creating anytime real-time learning spaces. And again, just a reminder, anytime is learning together at different times and real-time learning is learning together at the same time. So the first example that I have is with younger students um, in, here in the United States. This is second grade children who are ages seven to eight uh, and the elementary school teachers teach all subjects. So just to give you a little bit of context, this is one teacher who happens to have an aide who is with them. Um, this was done during the pandemic when uh, parents requested that teachers meet with the students every day even though it was totally virtual. They used the real-time learning in something called Google Meet, which is kind of like Zoom. And the anytime learning, they used an interface that's very common here in the United States uh, that's called Seesaw. And that's where they put all of their learning assignments. Um, they had approximately 20 students. They split them into two groups. And you can see here a schedule where they started in the morning with a real time, everybody together in the virtual setting. Then in the morning, half of the group, 10 of the students attended the real time work and the other 10 left the real time space to do any time learning. There was a break and then they would switch in the afternoon where the any time folks came into the real time experience and the real time folks from the morning participated in the anytime. And then at the very end of the day, they pulled everyone back together. So this is what Karen, who was the teacher, this is what Karen's classroom looked like. Uh, and again, this was her dining room. Um, they used Zoom and Google Meets and she created all of the spaces to make it look like a real classroom. The, the manipulatives, um, the ideas of uh, the home suite classroom. And so again, creating that space virtually is very, very similar to you taking a lot of time at the beginning to set up your classroom the way that you want your students to come into it and recognize that at school, we're here for certain reasons and we're here um, to be part of a learning community together. So the anytime space uh, like I said, was organized in something called Seesaw. And you can see here how the two teachers, uh, this was the regular classroom teacher, this was the teacher's assistant, and the students came, and this was a digital space that they could access and click on the three different assignments for that day that they would complete somewhat independently, but we'll talk about how they pulled it in together. And so this is an example of a writing activity and a reading activity. And the idea in the anytime learning is to engage kids in doing something that they document their, their learning and their thinking. So in the writing side, they're being asked to create something, write about what you see here, taste, feel, and touch in the fall and upload it into the seesaw space. And then the reading side, they're going to listen to a story that was pre-recorded or read by somebody aloud, and then they're going to design a plan to keep squirrels away from a bird feeder. So each time you can see the engaging activities that they're doing and documenting digitally. So this gives you an idea of how Karen um, organized her learning and this writing assignment where they're coming into Seesaw and 
organizing it into real time and any time. And you can see here, the real time piece was, again, everybody was pulled in in the morning. They have their meet and greet. They're inspired. The teacher explains the purpose of the lesson, has a quick hook. And then this, the group breaks up into two. The real time folks stay and they connect with the teacher and the aide. They go through a mini lesson and then they even work sitting at their computers, sometimes working quietly, sometimes talking aloud and writing while the other group leaves the real time space and sometime before they meet in the afternoon, they go and do the writing ahead of time. And that's the engage. So the, the any time is they're being inspired as a group real time we're going to connect because we have people and we can have conversations together and then any time you can complete this writing activity post it in a way that you can share it and then in the afternoon again they switch and the people who connected now engage and the people who engaged now connect and they come and they talk and they go through the mini lesson and that's pretty much what real-time anytime learning looks like for that particular activity and you can see here that this is where the intentionality in selecting certain digital texts and tools work and are designed to supplement what's going to allow me to inspire kids I'm going to select some really compelling photos and images what's going to allow me to connect I'm going to find a space that allows me to break out into small group, uh, groups. What's going to allow me to engage? I'm going to find a seesaw um, digital space for them to draw and write in. Or sometimes they might just draw in their journal and take a photograph and upload it into the digital space. So each time you want to think about not just the experiences themselves, but this is the intentional selection of these texts and tools that are conducive to the inspire, engage, connect, and share. So I'll move through a little faster here. This is a similar kind of activity with the reading. So we meet in the morning. I inspire you as a whole group. There's some kind of a hook. And then we split into two groups. Ten children leave. They go on to Seesaw and do the anytime learning where they engage with the activity. Sometimes they're listening, sometimes they're marking up the text, they're documenting, they're annotating, they're uploading it to share. While the other people are working and connecting with me, and again, we're providing the short mini lesson and the opportunity for students to collaborate and connect. And the key is to not use the, the real time to just talk like I'm doing right now if I had you all together, we would be talking together and you would be connecting and collaborating and creating. So right now I'm creating an example of any time learning for you and then provided some links for you to go and explore so that maybe one day we could actually come together and meet real time. And again, here's these particular texts and tools that fit that context. So we're going to jump now, and this is just to give you an example where the elementary school teacher used Anytime Real Time to design a particular lesson. This is just an example that you'll have the screenshot later that you can explore in more detail, but this is a middle school, 7th grade teacher with 10, 11, 12 year olds, and she designed her Anytime Inspire and Engage across three or four days. And so she might only see them every other day. And so she's inspiring them and engaging them anytime. They're documenting their work. And then two or three days later, she'll bring them back into the real time and work on things together. And the last example that I'll share with you is all the way at the higher end with my college students who happen to be elementary education pre-service teachers, much like some of you or perhaps you're already teaching, um, to give you an example of what it looks like in my classroom. Again, I am one teacher. I meet twice a week with students. I have about 20 students. Every day it varies because of the opportunities that I set up. Usually 
there's about 15 students who are meeting face to face. And then there's five students who join us virtually from home and on different days, those might be different students. The tools that I use for real time include zoom. Google suite, which is a combination of Google Docs slides and forms and something called Jamboard. And I'll share some examples with you and then anytime. Here's a number of management systems like Brightspace or Google Sites or some tools like Padlet or Satori or Flipgrid. And I'll share a little bit more in part three of this webinar uh, in particular about Wakelet. So one of the questions that teachers often have is what does this actually look like to have students in person with masks having to sit three or four feet apart could you ever possibly work in small groups and then how do we include the people who were three states away who are joining us through zoom and so this is a picture of my classroom last fall you can see here here's a group of three students who are three feet apart their masks they're working together and they're all in person here's another group of three there's other groups over to the far right. This student back here, though, has been linked up with other students who are meeting in Zoom. And the reason I do that is because the real time conversation, if the people in Zoom are just listening, then it's not real time for them. They could just be listening to the recording. And so this is me standing up at the front. This is my uh, big computer station. This is my laptop. And this is an example of you can see that student now who's sitting in my classroom in front of me is meeting with these two students who were home in different states meeting through zoom. And here's me taking a picture of all of this. And so you can see on the screen where I can toggle through each of the groups work now simply on my computer, whether they're in person or um, outside of my classroom, but all of these students are engaged in real time learning. Just to give you an idea, some of the challenges, certainly of multitasking, but this is what a teacher workspace looks like when you're trying to juggle all of these different things with real time learning where I've got my Zoom in my breakout rooms and you can see they're working in different groups. I'm using a browser to toggle through. I don't have to walk to see what they're doing anymore over to their group because some of them aren't even in the room. But I can simply click and see each group's work. I can insert comments and type right in and intervene. I can send um, messages through chat, even though these students are in breakout rooms. So now, even when I meet face to face in my real time learning, we all sit in Zoom and have digital documents open so that we can do these kinds of things. So I did want to take a minute also to keep to let you know about a social emotional check in that we do every day now in class. It looks different every day, but this is an example of something called a mood meter, which is from the Yale Center for um, Emotional Intelligence, and I put their link here. And this is just something where I put it up on a Google slide, whether they're in Zoom or um, right there face to face, they can either type their feeling word or they can drag one of these icons and move it to where they're feeling. Sometimes we talk about it, sometimes we don't, but it's really just a way to gauge where people are, where their energy is or isn't, validate where people are, and sometimes, yes, we stop and have conversations about what's going on um, and strategies they're using to deal with it because that has become a normal part now, an important part of uh, real-time learning, whether we're face-to-face -face or virtual. So these are some other examples of social emotional check-ins. Sometimes um, I use a Google form and I collect more information. Uh, sometimes we have journal prompts of gratitude. So again, lots of different ways in all grade levels, but especially in college, 
I've gotten feedback from my students that they really, really value this as an opportunity to connect themselves and also as a model of what they could do with their own students. So what I'll share in this last little bit here is the same way that I showed you how Karen, the second grade teacher, organized her lessons. I decided to take my entire syllabus and organized it in any time real time learning and really the details aren't so much important here as the idea that real time is when we spend time together in class whether they're sitting next to me or seven states away but in the zoom and we're connecting and we're sharing and any time is their homework but again I've restructured the homework and very intentionally created um, tasks and spaces to inspire and engage students and they're working on things that they're documenting and then when they come back to real time we pull those documents up and we keep going to collaborate and share and so once you have the link each of these are live links that gives you examples of the technologies that I used but the important thing here is really for you to start to think about the digital texts and the digital tools become intentionally designed learning spaces that now we can combine and use both anytime and real time. And so we're building this classroom community that no longer is just in the four walls of our classroom, but in theory, it could be across the entire world. So in the last two minutes of this section of the webinar, I wanted to also let you know that if you clicked on this link, you'd be brought to several more examples in primary grades, at the district level, at middle school, and high school and college, so that you can start to see how teachers are creating these learning, and you can explore them anytime. So thank you very much for listening on the second part of the webinar, uh, and I hope to see you soon for the third part.